2022 has been a year of unprecedented shocks. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has created four new dynamics, each with the potential to profoundly alter the course of the energy transition across our four major emitters. Number one, commodity prices. Shortages of Russian pipeline gas into European markets have sent fossil fuel prices skyrocketing. Number two, stagflation. That rising commodity price has sparked an accelerated inflation environment, which is slashing growth outlooks globally. That's creating to an elongated period of stagflation. Number three, energy security. Putin's weaponization of Russian gas flows has shown the world the imperative of energy independence and the importance of safeguarding energy security. Number four, political tensions. The invasion of Ukraine has abruptly ended the peace and stability of the post-Cold War period. That's creating instability abroad, whilst an emerging cost of livings crisis is creating fracas and frictions at home. We'll look at the implications of these four trends across the four major emitters, the European Union, the United States, India, and of course, China. This is Beringa's State of the Transition. China, an emerging superpower and Russia's most powerful ally. Emissions in China have been exploding over recent decades on account of the country's rapid economic development. The opening up of China in the 1970s by Dao Xiaoping created explosive economic development. The consequences were rapid carbon intensive growth, which contributed to an increase in emissions. However, recently China has committed to peak emissions by 2030 and achieved net zero by 2060. China has performed a middling score in our credibility and durability methodology. On the credibility axis, we look at policy maturity, evaluating a country in accordance to its policy, legislative and regulatory commitments. On the durability axis, on the y-axis, we look at the momentum behind decarbonisation, looking at the strength and breadth of political support to meet those decarbonisation goals. Credibility in China has been middling on account for uh, acknowledging its high aspirations and targets for renewable energy deployment, for example, but also stymied by the significant role of coal within its energy mix, representing a significant proportion of new generation, even in recent decades. The durability axis in China has scored better, showing that the strength of commitment from the Communist Party in Beijing is relatively high, owing to the command and control nature of policy in China. It's also high due to the commitment to increase air quality in China, on account of middle class concerns about air quality in major urban and economic centres. We've updated the credibility and durability methodology and seen a small increase in the score on the credibility axis, however, falling scores on the durability axis. The credibility score in China has risen, but only marginally. The 14th five-year plan has set an aspiration for a 30% renewable energy capacity by 2030. And indeed, China is on course to exceed that goal. However, the credibility of the Chinese decarbonisation is also undermined by the role of coal. We've seen 65% of new generation capacity in 2021 continue to coal from coal-fired plants. That really undermines the notion that China is intending to peak emissions by 2030 with this accelerated ramp up of the coal-fired fleet. On the durability axis, we've seen major falls in the scores for China. When we look at the four major impacts of the invasion of Ukraine on global markets, the implications and ramifications for China have been negative in all but one. When we look at commodity prices, we can see that spikes in gas benchmarks in Asia and Europe has incentivized greater coal use in mainland China. The widely available and cheap resource in China often looks more positive in terms of its economics when gas prices are high. That has been seen to incentivize greater coal use this year and likely in the foreseeable future. Secondly, the policy priority of energy security does not necessarily mean an accelerated transition in China. Fears over blockades of the Straits of Malacca, maybe because of frictions with Taiwan, have re-emphasized the role of energy security in China.
But because of the widely available ample domestic supplies of coal, that necessarily incentivized greater capacity in the coal-fired fleet to safeguard energy independence. That runs contrary to the decarbonization agenda of the CCP in Beijing. Thirdly, stagflation. We know that the Communist Party tends to use carbon-intensive investment-led growth methods when growth is slipping. We saw that during COVID-19 as a huge spate of new industrial works and industrial motorways and apartment blocks were quickly thrown up across the country in order to stimulate growth. This made emissions peak as a response. We're also potentially seeing the same policy response in light of declining Chinese growth this time. Finally, where we haven't seen a huge impact is political tensions. The traditional challenges between municipalities and the central CCP have been kept to a minimum. However, we recognize that conflicts over prioritization of growth or climate commitments may be a source of frictions between these two players in the future. The invasion of Ukraine has shown just how vulnerable and susceptible the course of the energy transition is to major macroeconomic and political events. If you'd like to understand more about the course of the energy transition and what it means for your investments and exposures, reach out to any of Beringa's experts.